So like you were saying, there's now going to be a video on the internet of our interaction forever. So don't run for a political office. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I'll, I'll start recording in a second and then that's what I'll go out on iTunes and all that. Okay. Oh. I always have to make sure I mute uh, my own YouTube, which I'd never ever do. Do you by chance have headphones that you could pop in? Because I can hear myself and it's going to drive uh, me insane. Let me see. I'm not sure. Okay. One sec. Okay, it's only she potentially hurt herself. Hopefully she didn't. I really hope she didn't. <laughs> Oh, that. No, sorry. My cat nope. threw them under the fridge and I don't know how to get them out. Fair enough. A lot of noises happened. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, a lot of noises, really? No, yeah. Well, it sounded like something, stuff got knocked over and I feared for your safety for a second. <laughs> it was just the door. Oh. <laughs> All right. I will call off the dogs. Um. I will start recording then if you are set. Yep. Cool. And it, your last name is Fieschi? Yep. Okay. I don't want to fuck that one up. Welcome to episode 88 of the podcast Terror production of the Galactic Network. I'm your host, Matt Stein. With me as always is Corey. I need a haircut, Scott. Corey, how are you? That's harsh, man. I don't need. I mean, I I had nothing. I had nothing. It's like I'm I'm still I'm a '90s '80s child. I don't I look okay. You're my silver fox. Thank you. That's yeah, all I want to hear. Long flowing locks. Make a man feel good about himself. Uh, our esteemed guest this week. I have to use the word esteemed because she's way fucking cooler than we are. Uh, she's the creator of the successfully greenlit project Sylvania Grove, uh, which was on Seaton's Park, uh, and also the creator of Horrorman's Productions. Rebecca Fieschi. Rebecca, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks. Um, now we're sticking with our theme of stealing guests from our friends Jack and Dan at We Studios. If you also listen to that, you would have heard Rebecca on a 90th percentile a couple of weeks ago. Um, we'll try really hard to live up to We Studio standards, but you're inevitably taking a step down. So yeah. sorry. Um, but anyways, uh, before we get into this, do you want to tell people about everything that you do, the Hormance and, and your, your Seed and Spark? Uh, sure. So um, with my production company, I make uh, fantasy and gothic horror films. So far, we've made only short films, but we're w working on making feature films. And um, so Sylvania Grove, which just crowdfunded on Seed and Spark, is a fantasy short film about a 10 year old girl that doesn't fit in anywhere. She doesn't fit in at school and she doesn't feel appreciated by her parents. So she only finds refuge in fairy tales and fantasy stories. And one night um, a fantasy creature comes out of her book and leads her into the woods where she has an adventure. So this just, yeah. So did you like brainchild this thing and do all the filming and everything? Um, yeah, so it's not shot yet. It's so we are funded and we're in pre-production now, but yeah, I wrote it there and I'm going to direct it and I'm producing it. Nice. That's awesome. Well, thanks for coming to hang out. Well, thanks for having me. I mean, there's probably like 12 things you could do that are cooler than hanging out with us on a Sunday night, but we appreciate you being here. But probably not, actually. This is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could continually get abused by your cat. Yeah. So I got to do a fight. It happens. It happens. That's, That's why cool. I just don't have cats. I don't want to have to fight my pets. Nothing. Corey's got cats. Every week you complain about your dogs making noise in the next room. They're and quiet right now. They're cats. They're right little now. angels. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure that it just a children's NyQuil in the, the food bowl probably did its job, but... <laughs> it's actually not a bad idea. We, we no, usually I'm better drill genius. them if I need them to shut up. That's a good idea. No, that makes me sound like a terrible human being. Yeah. 
Whatever. I feel like I need to point out the fact that it's three minutes in. I don't think I've said fuck and we haven't said a dick joke. Not yet. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, Rebecca's new to this and she knows that that's a big deal. <sighs> All right. Well, for more on this podcast, including show notes, contact information, subscription links, go to gncast.com. pot. You can chat with us on our Slack channel during our shows at gncast.com. Sign up. Sign up for our newsletter as well. Um, if you're new to this podcast, it's probably a good one. I feel like I will be pretty well behaved. Um, Corey's hair is just out of control, but dick jokes to a minimum. We're going to do some news. Then we're going to talk about the movie uh, Rosemary's Baby a little later, which I'm really curious to hear what Rebecca has to say about it. Just because of following what you've done thus far, I'm curious on your take. Um, before we get into the news, though, due to popular demand by the one person that emailed me, we're going to do our patented what you drinking? Rebecca, I don't think I've seen you take a drink of anything, so... I, I have a drink, but it's just water. That's fine. I'm you know, usually the only one drinking here, so it's fine. But it's like it's it's an M&M's cup, but it's Wolverine, so... Maybe. You get bonus points for the cup. Way cool cup. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Uh, <laughs> Corey, lift an iced tea? Uh, actually, I brought a Virgil's Special Edition Bavarian Nutmeg Root Beer which is oversized and lovely. I'm going to go buy a lottery ticket after this. I had one during the Christmas season. They're about five bucks a bottle. Uh, and I was just excited to see it in the Safeway. So yeah, it's a spoiler. Yesterday, I went to a beer release in Indiana. Okay. I sold one bottle of beer to someone for $250. Wow. Yeah. And I saw, I saw someone else buy a different variant of the beer for 600 So... You can't complain about a five dollar rup here anymore. <laughs> Two hundred fifty dollars for does it I, for that much money? You better say my name and dance. Um. Yes. And so, okay. So everyone gets four bottles of this beer, and then they make like seven or eight variants, and the variants are randomly handed out. All four of us got the same variant. So, uh, one guy sold it for two hundred. I sold mine for two fifty. Another one sold it for three hundred. And then we all just gave the fourth guy like 20 bucks to hang on to it. And then we'll just split the bottle because they're the 22 ounce bottles. I'm like, this is a fucking genius. We all make money and I still get to drink this beer. But not alone. No, I, know. I, I never. Drink It'll be alone. like one of those, those plots where all the guys there were in war together, put money into like a big pot and investment. And then years later, it's whoever is left alive gets to have all the money and then as you realize you're getting older and you don't know how much longer you're going to be around and you need the cash you Start wind up killing people. off the other people in the group Simpsons except for a beer yeah that it i think archer did it too yes yes um well i'm drinking winer winer beer uh Le tub from chicago because i spent far too much time in chicago this weekend which any amount of time is too much time in chicago really Le tub is what they call me in i Brandon. fucking hate chicago i really want to go to chicago why do you hate it i have a lot of bad experiences there i accidentally drove through south chicago this weekend like no one tried to kill me but still and traffic is just a. Uh, although you're you're in new york brooklyn right yeah yeah so i guess i can't really complain about chicago traffic but i live in rural wisconsin so chicago traffic is like getting a tooth pulled um, yeah, I only imagine. Yeah, I, I just I don't know. And, and people in Chicago are a lot of them are dicks. That's my interaction. Big the city. Corporation, the corporation <laughs> my wife works for is based out of Chicago. She's constantly talking about you know maybe going up to corporate someday, which means we'd have to move out that way. And I can't, I can't really frame whether or not it's going to be worse or better than living in the Bay Area. Uh, because our traffic is also shit. Although we're at, both at a point now where we're driving like 10 minutes to work every day. We finally live and work close enough to each other. But man, I don't like big cities at all. Like, um, I've there's... dealt with Detroit. I've dealt with San Francisco. I, I, I'm, I'm so happy to just live in a small town at this point. But it needs to have a comic book store and high-speed internet. Oh, uh, Chicago has AT&T's fiber. <sighs> That's AT&T though. Good. Well, that Google just, Fiber seems to be dead in the water. We don't need to get nerd boners in front of Rebecca. We just matter. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, the one thing I'll say is Chicago has like a really good train system. So had I been staying in Chicago, I probably would have just taken the train into town and then walked from there. But if you have to drive a lot, an extra three and a half hours to get somewhere. I feel like every time I see a show or a movie about sh Chicago, somebody gets shot in the subway. <laughs> <laughs> There's always something like really dramatic that happens. I've never actually used the, the um, subway there. So I don't know. Um, everyone I know who lives there lives in a suburb because they're a sales guy for a giant tech company. So it's, they're all, fuck it, whatever. Yeah, it, we've got BART out here, um, which is above ground. We had the, uh, the above ground trains in Detroit that got built in the 80s. Uh, so the only subways I've ever been on were in Canada. Uh, which is like a regular subway, except it's really apologetic about when they stab you. <laughs> the only subways I've ever been in, I like to get mayo on my sandwiches at. Du -du I think you can get that in the subways in Chicago. I know. I was trying to think of a way to oh, to like differentiate that it was a subway sandwich restaurant and really just fuck the dog on that one. I apologize. Um, let's do some news, I guess. We have a purpose here. You don't need to waste anyone's time. Uh, the first story we have is, uh, well, A, if you're not aware, Hellboy is being remade by Guillermo del Toro. Del Toro. No, it is not. Oh, wait. Oh, oh. Guillermo del Toro did the first two did you really? Hellboy films. Oh, yeah. Did not And, and they're, they're fantastic. The second one, especially. Uh, he is not going to return for this new film. And Ron Perlman, who played Hellboy in the first two films, is not going to be returned. This is a new oh, direction. Man. New writers, new director, uh, new star, uh, but they are going to be making a new Hellboy movie, which is going to be darker and more gruesome than the Del Toro versions. Um, the star was the the guy who played the cop in uh, Stranger Things, oh, uh, who's okay. a very good actor. He's been in a ton of stuff, and especially uh, he seems to be on the rise. And uh, the new screenwriter is Andrew Cosby. Man, I forget who who's going to be directing it, but it's it's got the backing of the creator, which is Mike McNola, which is great, and it's nice to see this character getting to continue. the The third Hellboy has been in development hell for the last several years because when the second movie came out, it was followed very quickly by The Dark Knight, which seems to have overshadowed a lot of other things that came out that summer. Uh, so it was it was kind of a struggle for Hellboy 2 at the same time that we were going to see a movie that was the last film, as we understood it, of uh, Heath Ledger before he passed away and was also an incredible movie. Um, but I, I kept hoping that there was going to be a find of this online, that people were going to pick up on it later and buy the, the Blu-ray and everything, and it just didn't seem to happen, which is too bad because it is... Del Toro's creature designs are beautiful, and it seemed like he did so many amazing things between this and his other stuff that but what he did with Hellboy and Perlman's role in Hellboy was fantastic. You you wanted to see that happen and continue on, but at least we're getting something still with the character. You know, it took them a couple of tries to do Judge Dredd correctly uh, with Carl Urban. And I think that sequel was really good. But then same thing, the film didn't get the audience that it deserved. I think people still had a stink in their mind from the uh, Stallone version. So I don't know. But I hope that this is good. Uh, David Harbour from Stranger Things is playing Hellboy and Neil Marshall, who directed The Descent and also did some of the directing on Game of Thrones, is directing this movie. And The Descent is apparently quite good, according to how many times my wife has watched it. Fuck yeah. Rebecca, have you watched the Hellboys at all? Are you a fan? So I watched the first one, and I really like it. But I, I don't know why I've never, I never got around to watching the second one. Oh, yeah, I really like considering what your theme is of your stuff the the horror mixed with romance kind of stuff the second one really does more of that in the story than the first one and the first one had had sort of the unrequited love between uh hellboy and um i can't remember the character's name unfortunately uh but but the second one does does an even bigger job of that 
I think you would really like it. And it, it's just, while there's a lot of stuff that takes place in kind of an underground society where all the monsters are, um, it's still, it's just beautiful to behold. I mean, it's just such gorgeous work. So the the new one, though, is a reboot, not necessarily a third film, though, right? Right. And and the, the first two films also had a spinoff uh, animated movies. You can find those. Uh, they were on Netflix for a while that had the voice. The voices were done by the cast from the films. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've had essentially four movies based around that team and their Hellboy. Although I don't know that Del Toro had anything to do with the animated films. So it, it's not like they haven't had their time. It's just especially when you think of, of films uh, and these kinds of films, you expect a trilogy at the very least. You expect that third one to kind of at least cap it off before they reboot five years later, Spider-Man, uh, Amazing Spider-Man, uh, <laughs> Spider-Man Homecoming. But that's that's not what we get here. And you can sit and you can harp on, it's not, well, it's not my Hellboy because my Hellboy had this. Well, my Hellboy is really the comics. Uh, but any Hellboy is better than Oh Hellboy, I, I think. We'll see. Unless it's like the fucking Punisher one that came after it it took several tries with punisher too it did taken a couple of tries and both failures with ghost rider i don't know we'll see yeah i'm curious to see how this pans out i was a fan of the first two uh, but i feel like hellboy being what hellboy is it needs to be dark and a lot of murder yeah hellboy uh, they kind of played it up with the superhero aspect, the the BPRD. There's a lot of dark in the comics. There's a lot of, of horror connections to it, but it's still, it, it was very lighthearted in the way that his character was, the way that he interacted with Abe Sapien mm -hmm. and some of the other people in the group, uh, which I think was smart to introduce audiences to it. But right now, horror is having a, a sort of renaissance, especially in the kind of um, general horror that goes back to like 80s style. We're seeing a lot of that. So it, it's a good time. And because it's got a, a bit of taking some of the heat from being on Stranger Things with the lead, I expect that will add to people being interested in it. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next story because I, I hope this interests Rebecca given the fact that it's fucking Nosferatu and that seems right up your alley. That's just me, though. Um, yeah, no. so we actually covered Nosferatu on this this podcast. First time I ever watched it, and um, now I'm actually going to have to rewatch it because it's it's got sound, <laughs> which it was a rough watch without sound, basically because I have the attention span of, of a newt. Um, but it, it, so the movie itself is now public domain or has been for a while. I don't remember what the public domain laws are. Not really my, not really my wheelhouse. But um, years. how long is it? A hundred years. I is think. it really? the The copyright laws keep changing. Mm -hmm. They keep getting stretched out further and further because of companies like Disney and Warner, uh, who own characters like Mickey Mouse and uh, Superman. And so they don't want to relinquish their rights, but anything from about before when they started getting into it, those copyrights can be it, adjunct. They can go away very easily. But everything since, it's like, oh, we're just going to go a little bit further. Oh, we're just going to go a little bit further. And we're just going to keep going further because they've got the giant lawyers to be able to argue it. Uh, so if you if you didn't make that cusp, if you were like Mark Twain's fame or something like that, well, you're fucked. But if you if you happen to make anything from 1960 on, uh, you're you're in perfect good shape to keep that forever, as long as you didn't sell the rights to the production company in the first place. Yeah. Well. Either way, this isn't the uh, podcast of uh, law or something. I don't know. I'm really not with it. But um, Nosferatu is now public domain. Therefore, people could add sound to it, and, and it appears that it that has been done. Um, there's a handful of new movie posters came out that are now calling it Nosferatu, the non-silent film. Um, you can go to nonsilentfilm.com. I'm, I'm under the assumption you can just watch it there, uh, which I think would be really cool. It'd be kind of 
curious to see what the Corey, have you watched any of this by chance? I, I watched the trailer for it and I'm definitely going to check it out on their website because I think when I watched it, you know, we, we both watched it from different sources. Mm -hmm. I think when I watched it, someone had done updated music for it. Yeah. Mine and is I, just uh, fucking quiet. Yeah. I saw something where, uh, the guy who plays slob on uh, Creepy Coffee Move Time, which is local to me, his company did sound for another silent movie that they updated and they broadcast on the local creature feature uh, show here in San Francisco area. And that was really cool. But but it, it just sort of depends on what their take is. I, I was wondering if this was going to be updated and it was going to include new sound effects, voices that were doing all the, the voiceover stuff, or if they had found audio from the original that somehow got recorded when they weren't expecting it to, to be able to ever play in the film. They just had someone recording something in the room. I wasn't sure what they were going to do, but it sounds a little bit more like it's a artistic direction that they decided to take on it. And the posters for it look really cool because it's, mm -hmm. it's the Nosferatu character standing in front of a microphone or wearing headphones and stuff. And it just gives the idea of, you know, the classic with this one little twist that makes a change. So, Rebecca, my question to you now, say you made a movie during the silent film era and for some some reason beyond science, you lived until it became public domain and this happened. Like, how I mean, how would you handle that? Um, I feel like I would be a little upset, I think. I, mean, <laughs> I watched the trailer for this and... Um, I think it's really interesting that they did it and I'm going to check it out, but it does sound a little goofy to me. It sounds like it might bring a very, like, like a, a comedy element to Nosferatu, which like I feel people might watch it and laugh. Like now it's, it's got a sound gimmick. It's very, you know, if it's just people like moving, making gestures and there's a sound that doesn't seem to truly belong to the picture, especially when it's um, voices. Not so much sound effects, but voice, voices, actors speaking. That might be a little funny. And the, that was the first thing I thought of was, like, having watched it without sound, when you read um, the text for speech, like, you, you form a voice in your head as to what that person mm -hmm. sounds like. And I, I feel like with someone having artistic freedom to make that person sound like whatever they think, it could kind of throw it off and, and almost make it comical, which sucks because this movie is what it is yeah. but in the same stroke they could do such a great job that it would make the movie 10 times better for someone that well, may that's also originally watched it that's the same effect that you have if you read a book and then someone makes a movie out of the book is that they cast some actor mm -hmm. and you're like oh that who isn't who should be why is matthew mcconaughey playing the man in black i don't understand it is he going to be hitting on high school girls i don't know <laughs> that's not right i mean i don't have that argument because i've not read the books and and i think mcconaughey looks great in that but I, that's kind of an example is that we all have our imagination and what what we filled in the holes in our minds no one's going to be able to nail that perfectly and probably should you know because you have to be holding to the art as you see it as the art maker um more than you can to any single member out of the audience because you have to try to appeal to as much of the audience as you can or realistically to none of the audience and just to your vision uh and if if someone doesn't like your vision well then it's up to someone else to come along and bring their vision mm -hmm. but uh rebecca have you ever or would you ever consider working on a project that was a silent film or didn't have the i mean some sound, absolutely this kind of stuff, but doing something that's kind of a throwback to that idea. Oh, yeah, totally. I would really love that. I made a short film. I made a few short films that don't have dialogue, and they have music and sound design. I think no music and sound design is really, really hard nowadays to convey. Like, it's so much part of what cinema is, taking away music and sound design. It's really, really rough, especially with, you know, our attention span. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I think it would be really, in I love uh, the whole telling a story visually above anything else. So I think that's really interesting. And I love, I like silent films a lot, but I, don't, I would prefer to watch them when they have a orchestra playing too, or you know, not yeah. just 
the image, like a little music. I think it really helps our, it's just like our brain focus on something. Oh, yeah. Yes. When, when I watched Nosferatu and I had the like ultra silent version, I had to listen to, uh, I listened to the band Russian Circles, which is like instrumental rock. Cause I'm like, I, I can't, I cannot handle no sound. Like I can't even sleep without sound anymore. It's, it's pretty bad. Yeah, I think we're yeah, we really love- now. I freak out really quick when it's too quiet. It, I'm the same way. Like if uh, if my wife is gone and for whatever reason my dogs aren't being assholes, like I have to have music or something on. Like silence is unsettling to me, which I don't know. So then you start like, hearing thoughts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no one wants to know what's going on up there. <laughs> Well, also, I mean, Matt and I are both homeowners, and so when it's too quiet, I hear the house creaking, and all I do is I think, what is that? What's falling apart? Oh, great. Here's my ulcer. Uh, it's just, I don't, right. I don't want that kind of quiet. I want I want something that's going to take all of the focus off of my own brain and put it into some little pocket of, you get to control the way I think for a little while. I am perfectly docile. Uh, thank you. I am a perfect American. Awesome. So yeah, I'm currently like if I hear something in the house, I just go, eh, fuck it. Well, that's yeah, a, you're that's leaving a, that's the a, house. Yeah, yeah, we we move in twelve days. We bought a new house, so I'm like, that's a, that's a. And her name's Amanda. I'm like, that's an Amanda problem. <laughs> I, don't to, I don't have to worry about it. You I turn it into an home. SCP. That that's not fair. That's that's a great place to be for two weeks until you get to the new house, and then it all starts up over again. Oh no, yeah, it totally does. I'm just I can't wait, and it's more. There's more house. Yeah. Anyways, so yeah, go to nonsilentfilm.com. You can listen to uh, you can listen to and watch notes for Atu, like never before. Uh, then the next news story, Corey. I know you haven't. Rebecca, have you watched the Exorcist TV show? No, I have not. Oh boy, this will be a quick one then. Um, Fox says the Exorcist has been renewed for season two. I'm the only one here that has watched it. I mean, it's pretty good. It is very graphic for being a Fox TV show. That was the first thing that I realized. Um, but I'm happy. I'm happy that they're making a second season, I guess. Or when they first announced it, we had a quite lengthy discussion at how Fox could fuck this one up. And surprisingly, they didn't. There's still time. <laughs> There's a second season now. But uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll be coming out Halloween-ish. I don't know. There's no date. Whatever. Yeah, just the fact that it's been renewed, they'll they'll find the right place to put it on their schedule. They they canceled yeah. some other shows. They finally canceled Sleepy Hollow, uh, which was more of a genre show that wasn't necessarily scary, but dealt with horror elements. Uh, this I always go back to Hannibal on NBC, which was far more graphic and and just kind of vile in the visuals, although still a, a very attractive show for what it was. Um, so it's nice to see when when they do the the horror elements on regular TV stations uh, these days. It's nice to see when they they do something and they still take risks. Uh, and it's even nicer when it actually gets to succeed and come back. And the fact that you haven't shit on it of all people, Matt, because that is sort of what you do, uh, is is a good sign as well. I mean, it makes me more interested in watching the show because. One, it was on Fox, and I'm like, "Fuck you, Fox! You've ruined half the things that I've liked on you." And and second, The Exorcist isn't my favorite horror film to begin with, but to hear that you enjoyed it enough to stick it through the whole season, uh, and that you're happy to see it return, means that maybe there's something there that I missed. Yeah, I mean, I recommend it. Um, yeah, that's that's about the most I can say. I recommend it when there's all sorts of other shit that I could recommend. I would recommend The Exorcist. Moving on. Uh, last news story we have. Well, I kill time while it loads. Um, there's an animated horror movie coming. It's a stop motion film called Chuck Steel Night of the Trampires. All I've seen is I, I've not looked at the trailer, but I looked at the, the still image of the trailer and I'm excited. It looked right up your alley. It really did. I saw this and it it's kind of there was a eighties comedy show called Sledgehammer that was just that basic badass cop who's like or or what was the other guys with Mark Wahlberg and Will Ferrell? 
Mm -hmm. It's it's like all the cop tropes and everything. So this looks like a cop who who is is always got his boss yelling at him. Um, just the, the weird things of like the comedy of what you get with stop motion stuff, and then they decided to put in vampires <laughs> that are homeless called trampires, uh, which is why I'm wearing my no no hobo shirt today. Uh, <laughs> it looks really funny. It it seemed like something that you would enjoy, and I I kind of love stop animation. There's been a few films the last few years, usually from the same company. They did Coraline by Neil Gaiman. Uh, they did uh, Box Trolls and a couple other things, uh, all really good. But this is this is a little bit more borders on the ridiculous and the over the top. The punk rock looking vampires all look great. Uh, it just it looks like a fun a really fun time. Leica is making this. Is it the same as Coraline, really? Huh. No, I, I don't thought... think they're making it, no. Oh, no okay. It reminded me of them, though. Because oh, okay. we haven't seen a lot of stop-motion stuff. Stop-motion used to be a big thing, uh, even used in live-action films. You'd see the stop-motion stuff for the Jason the Argonauts and Clash of the Titans. Uh, but now it it's a lot of work for people to do for you know what can be limited return compared to the, the quick, cheap animation uh, like we were just talking about Archer. Archer is very simple animation. It's used effectively. I think it makes a great show, but it's all based around the voice actors and and the comedy. Uh, this is people who are making ornate puppets and sets for those puppets and shooting, moving a tiny little bit, shooting, moving a tiny little bit. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that you see people doing online with Legos now, as opposed to the full artistic movement of of trying to do the whole thing from scratch it's it's closer to robot chicken mm -hmm. except uh frankly looks way funnier so i'm what, i'm excited for it did you see that this is the second chuck Steele movie yeah and you can watch the first one i guess online uh chuck mm -hmm. Steele raging, raging balls, balls of, of steel justice. justice yeah um i was reading some of the character names the captain of the police force name is jack shit and uh, the A55 Auto Cop, a.k.a. Ass Face. This is, you were right, this is right up my alley. This is really, this is totally you. This is, if you let your brain actually listen to itself a little bit, this is the kind of stuff that you would dream up. <laughs> it's just better when I don't. It, it's like Wallace and Gromit <laughs> just taken to the, to the, the, uh, the extreme. To the bad taste level, I was going to say the the old Peter Jackson horror movie stuff is what Ooh, it looks like. It's a good movie. Yeah, you can get uh, uh, Chuck Steele Raging Balls of Justice of Steel Justice. Sorry, for uh, I don't know how to say ninety nine cents in in European money, but it's that. I don't know <laughs> if it's like ninety nine cent euro. It's ninety nine cents. Is it really? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm not the smartest out there. No, most things are different, so makes sense. Well, I know that like they'll say like five pound, which I know is like five dollars, but you know whatever. We don't have to. But not actually money. dollars. Yeah, yeah. I just the last thing I want to do is sound dumber than I already do. But yeah, it's out there. It's on their website. Get it. Um, I don't. Did you see a release date for this at all, Corey? It just says coming 2017. Yeah, not a release date for this one, uh, but the fact that you can watch the first one, see if it's if it's something that you're interested in to see the sequel. The first one came out in 2013, and if if you like that, then then this is something to look forward to. Our uh, is beat beat you from Sweden, Norway. Corey, can you answer this? No, because every time I say it, it's wrong. I I, I want to say he's Swiss, but then I always want to say that. And I'm always wrong. Waiting, waiting patiently. Waiting patiently. He's in the chat right now. He confirmed that it's 99 cents. It is, he is from Switzerland. Um, so beat our Swiss correspondent. That's what I wanted to say. It's 99 cents. Um, so yeah, check out Chuck Steele. Uh, it's coming 2017. And it looks really cool. Um, yeah, nightofthetrampires.com. That's going to do it for the news. Um, let's go ahead and get into... Our discussion on Rosemary's Baby, which was Rebecca's pick, which I was really surprised it took 88 episodes for someone to pick Rosemary's Baby, which I'm really happy because this is by far one of my one of my favorite movies. Um, 
So thank you I want to know that. if it was if there was someone who actually thought through, oh, we're going to be doing this on Mother's Day. No, so I only realized today, and I thought it was really interesting that we were talking about Rosemary's baby on Mother's Day. I think that's amazing. <laughs> I didn't even think about it until you pointed it out. Hmm. No, they're all with that. Um, Corey, do you want to um, recap it, start to? All right, well, I'm going to admit, first of all, this is my first time seeing the movie. Uh, so... I, uh, it's one of those ones that I haven't watched and I think because I just assumed that I knew the story it's it's been referenced so much I've certainly seen uh, episodes of shows where they reference it like psych did some stuff with the Rosemary's Baby um, my wife was watching some movie with Gabby Hoffman a couple weeks ago that looked very obviously ripped off of Rosemary's Baby but it is a classic it's from 1968 it stars Mia Farrow uh, John Cassavetes, Ruth Gordon, who is beloved uh, from Harold and Maude and other things. And I didn't realize this. Charles Grodin is in it uh, and plays Dr. Hill, which made me really excited when I when I looked at the screen closely. I'm like, that looks like Charles Grodin. No, that can't be Charles Grodin. Charles Grodin is funnier than shit. He wouldn't be in this. No, he's in it. He's awesome. Uh, and was her doctor, was Dr. Abraham Saperstein... Ralph Bellamy, was he the guy from Trading Places and from that scene in Coming to America, like one of the two guys with Don Amici who bets against them? Because uh, that's who I think it was uh, watching him in the film. Yes, he is in Coming to America. Rock on. Uh, so already big cast. Uh, but the the premise is, is that this young couple move into this apartment in the city. Uh, the husband is a actor who's just done plays and they kept saying the name of the plays over and over again and a couple of commercials for tv and he hasn't really had any huge success yet they moved in this apartment they meet their neighbors uh first rosemary meets the young woman who's staying with the neighbors who almost immediately kills herself and they're trying to figure out the circumstances as to why, but it doesn't seem very nefarious. They just said that she had a lot of problems with, uh, she had lived on the streets, she had done drugs and stuff before, but her life had cleaned up and she was doing better. So they weren't sure exactly what it was that happened. Uh, as they become closer with their, their neighbors who are older people, I think around 79 or so, uh, they get kind of pulled into always hanging out with them. They lose track of a lot of their other friends uh, Rosemary gets pregnant, but while she does, her husband becomes more and more distant, but also starts finding more and more success in regards to his career. Uh, she starts to become suspicious that her neighbors have nefarious reasonings as to why they're always involved with her. She builds a trust, trust of them, of her husband, of her doctor, and uh, goes through a lot of pain and illness wh while dealing with her pregnancy. And is always told, oh, you're fine. It's going to be okay. It'll clear up in a couple of days. And then months later, she's just looking gaunt and half dead. And her old friends see her and say, no, that's not right. You need to go get a second opinion. And her husband puts the gabosh on that. And she starts to do better again. Starts falling in the same trap, but starts to realize more and more that something else is wrong. And the story is basically trying to figure out what's happening. So do you think that they moved into this place because he had already made a deal with them and Satan? Or do you think that moving there resulted in the, the deal with the devil? I think, that, that one. I think that moving there resulted in that. And not yeah. the other. It gets I agree. Point. Well, it makes sense because he gets, he gets distant after he... Uh, after they move. We, we can have spoilers, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry. We have a spoiler alert before the show. Uh, thanks to, to our old pal, Jack. Um, but yeah, you can say whatever you want. Um, yeah, I know. I just jumped right to the end because I was thinking about it for a couple of days. Um, I, I The sex scene with the devil is a little weird, too. But it's supposed to be weird. <laughs> Definitely made me uncomfortable. Um, yeah, it's really... It has a couple levels of discomfort because one witnessing it, uh, which but they they play it off because there's a couple of times where she is falling asleep or is drugged, 
as it turns out, where she seems to be dreaming and parts of her dreams just kind of like shift into reality a little bit and then shift back out. Uh, but there is that point where the, the scene where she's being raped essentially um, is happening where she kind of wakes up and says, no, this is real. This is really happening. And she's trying to get herself out of the, the idea that it's a dream. But the next morning when she wakes up and she finds the scratches on her back, her husband says, Oh no, I just didn't want to miss baby making night. Uh, Cause we were, even though he had said at first, like we're not gonna do this tonight. It can happen tomorrow. And then it just sort of like, Oh, well you were unconscious. So I figured what the fuck. So in and of itself, it's already her husband had sex with her while she was asleep, wasn't conscious enough to actually give consent. That's itself already gross. Uh, although it was 1968 and throughout this entire film, I kept admiring how many people were giving her alcohol and smoking around her while she was pregnant. Um, but beyond that, then we find out later on, oh, no, it wasn't actually your husband. Uh, we had the the devil have sex with you. So did, did you think it was actually her husband since this is the first time you've watched it? Because I can't remember what I thought the first time I watched it. No, they show bestial features and arms and stuff. Yeah, but since uh, she was hallucinated, maybe you were the first time viewer. Because, because I had such a backstory knowledge of it, I didn't come into it completely unaware of what the story was about. So no, I, I kind of realized what it was. I'd also seen a very similar scene in a movie called Meridian, uh, Kiss of the Beast or something that was an 80s schlock horror movie from, I think, Full Moon Productions. And the whole thing, I didn't realize seemed straight out of this although it also involved a little person it's called meridian kiss of the beast yes Just said fact check there for you thank you i guess that's a that's an interesting question to ask like if you thought if this being your first view did you actually think that that was her husband or, or kind of what happened um they do go a couple of times of trying to make the audience mislead the audience into believing that it's all in her head. They they take a couple passes at, you know, she's just having uh, what he, he says later on is it's prepartum depression and all these things are just, she's leading herself to become panicked and it's not really what's happening. Well, I think the, the, there's two things on that. Um, one is that you could still kind of say, well, maybe it was all in her head because, you know, it's a movie and in the way it's made, you never know, well, did this really happen to her or was it all in her head? But I think that um, the most interesting thing about this movie is not so much the story. The story is interesting, but it's pretty basic, but it's the way it's executed and how you you know what's going on as the audience. But every time you you like her, you keep hoping that this is not real and there's going to be a way out. And, and I think that's really what makes the movie so powerful. And the fact that at the end she realizes that she basically birthed Satan Jr. And she's still like, no, this is my child. I want to take care of it. Mother's instinct. I, which is, yeah, which is insane. Um, and yeah, they, and they that, totally like push her to do it too. Which they they encourage her for it, and and you could see one of the ladies like, but she's just gonna, she's just gonna try to take the kid and run or do something, and and the guy's like, no no, she's the mom, she'll do the right thing. Let's give her a chance. Uh, she's in a room full of twenty people who are all like saying "Hail Satan" in front of her, <laughs> so uh, they probably felt like they had the jump on her if they needed to. She had already dropped the knife when she walked in there. I did appreciate that she went in there with a knife that when her husband's like it's all be okay we'll we'll move away we will have nothing but success now we'll have more kids and she doesn't just accept that she spits in his face i felt that there was still it was good to see her retain that venom against what happened to her to to not just have blind acceptance but her acceptance was never about what they did to her her acceptance was but this is my child um, yeah. Which is the one thing I could stomach from that. Even that was hard, but that was the most palatable of the, okay, this is how we're going to go going forward. 
through the whole movie, she really, really wants kids. And at no point does she want to harm her child. She's very, very preoccupied about the safety of her baby. So I think that in the end, it was kind of like she only had one real option. It's either she accepts it and she takes care of the baby or she just goes completely insane. Yeah, and they probably would either keep her captive or murder her like they did the other girl or any number of things. They, they said that they've tried numerous times and this is she was the woman that was chosen to actually have the child. Uh, so it already makes her special. And you have to wonder if part of the reason why she was chosen is because they felt that her love for her yet her still to come baby was going to be so big that they would be able to control her and keep her as a mother to it, no matter what the circumstances were. Do you think that maybe she kind of knew what was going on, but she wanted for it so badly to be false that she kind of was trying to convince herself? I I don't think so. So you never really see a point where she like like it clicks. Uh, I it, I think it's it's a slow understanding, but I think that like the true like. And the most disturbing thing about this movie is that the, where the real problem is, is with her husband. She's so, like, he, he's so amazing to her. She, he's like the prince char charming, he's perfect, that she completely trusts him. And even though when he's telling her, oh yeah, I ra raped you last night while you were sleeping, she's just kind of like, oh, okay. Well, cool. actually, there are times yeah. when it seems yeah. like that they I don't have the perfect relationship, though. There are times like when he's trying to get her to eat the, the chocolate oh. mousse, and, and she's like... They don't have a perfect relationship. I think yeah. she's very abused. Yeah. She's very it, mentally abused and just madly in love with this image of her husband. That yeah, she's like, okay, I'll do it. it, but she seems like she's like, but you fucking know I don't like you right now. Um, and then she still hides the stuff, which, I mean, that's what I appreciate it, is that she's not completely weak. But she's not exactly strong either because she she's on her own. She's in a strange place. They, as a cult, they cut her off from all the people that she used to hang out with. So when she decides she wants to have a party with all her friends, her husband's like, no, that's a terrible idea. Or, okay, well, at least we'll get uh, Minnie and Roman over. And she's like, no, I don't want Minnie and Roman over. This is for me. This is for people that are under the age of 60. You know. And he's like, well, thank God I made the cut. You can serve drinks, asshole. Uh, but in so many ways, it's like they eliminate all of her support structure so that only the people who are a part of this are able to influence her. So she's left to be kind of powerless. And the fact that she comes up with any kind of strength to fight against them uh, as people around her either go blind or are dying um, is, is amazing. It is the testament of her character. But it's all about the fact that she's trying to protect her kid less about what she's trying to do to protect herself. Yeah, I don't I don't think that she's like a weak character. Like the word you use of powerless is much more true to her. I think that everything that happens is like the all things that happen to abuse women in general or just a abusive relationship, you get cut all your relationships outside of um this one person or the person the people that are using you are all cut out of your life so you you don't know the difference between reality and fantasy anymore you don't know where you stand you don't know where you have your strength and yeah really i think if her husband wasn't in the whole thing she this would not have happened right mm -hmm. she, she would she you can see very early that she was interested in talking to Minnie and Roman and going over there for dinner first, but she wasn't interested in going back the next night. Yeah. And she wasn't interested in always hanging out with them. That's what it became. It was like the first night. And I think that's when it starts to happen is Roman starts seducing Guy uh, to this idea after their first night, their first dinner together. Mm -hmm. And that's when they start laying the plans for what's going to happen going forward. And he's like, sure, because what they do is they prove to him, okay, now that you're on our team, the next thing that happens is his competitor for the parts that he's trying to go for goes blind. You know, so they show, hey, we can cast a spell and now you're going to start to have success that you didn't have before. And that leads him. If we had seen this from the perspective of him, of the slow enticement of like, 
now you're going to join our our cult and you're going to allow us to impregnate your wife with with the devil and everything because of all of these great things this essential lottery ticket you're about to win um we we would have known a little bit more about was he evil or was he just greedy and how how much greed collected to destroy the trust that he had with his wife well i i don't know how, how you feel about it or i haven't really discussed this with anybody else but I don't see him feel looking regretful at any moment. He just seems kind of okay with the whole thing. Even at the end, he's like, oh, we'll just move away. But it, it doesn't seem like it's that big a deal. The whole, and I wonder if this is because he's like a male stereotype, like an old school male stereotype, but he doesn't understand anything that a woman can go through. The whole carrying a baby aspect and caring for the baby that she has carried, whatever the outcome of the baby and the whole. There's know. a couple of there's a couple of times where where key things I think are said about that. One is after um, she gets raped, um, she says to him that he doesn't look at her anymore. You know, she calls him out on the fact that he, he doesn't ever look at her. And he's like, no, I look at you. And so he has to adjust how he acts around her because he realizes that he's not been treating her the same. Probably because he just saw, you know, Satan jump on her. Uh, and in the the scene where she walks into the room and everybody's there gathered around her baby that she's now discovered is actually alive, he's standing in the door frame behind everybody else, and everybody's looking at her, and they're all like, "Yeah, you know, you did this great thing. You gave birth to the son of Satan. Woohoo!" And he's standing and he's looking away. He already he knows that she's just discovered everything about him. Like it's there's no hiding it anymore. And so he goes and he makes that last stab of, but now we're going to be okay. We did this one thing and it's this horrible thing, but it's done. And now we get to breed all the, you get to enjoy all the successes from it um, and and do all these other things. Now our lives are so improved because I, I fucked you over this one time, uh, which is total abuser mentality of like, I know I just did you wrong, but it's all going to be okay now. Yeah, I interpreted the whole thing of him not looking at her and and the ending scene as kind of shame, you know? So he's, because he's still human, so he has this level of shame, but not, I didn't feel guilt. Maybe there is. I kind of discover something new every time I watch the movie. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm at the point where all I see is shame. Maybe I'll see something else in my mind. Yeah. And it maybe wasn't even shame. Maybe it's just the fact that he felt that if he would look at her, she would realize that he did it. You know, it's like, hide your eyes, don't let them see the cards you're holding, that kind of thing. It, it, it is hard to tell what his motivations were, but whatever they were, they were shit. Uh, yeah. So I kind of wish that if, if nobody else died in the movie, I kind of wish that she had gotten to stab him. Yeah. Well, that, I'm, that would I'm fairly certain he did it all for himself. You know, and that's that's really apparent. Um, yeah, that's all I really got to say. I did want to point out. Uh, Beat mentioned that there's he thinks that maybe the 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 baby, the seed, um, was influencing her, and she really didn't have any control over herself because I mean, obviously, if you're carrying the spawn of Satan, there's a pretty good chance that you're not going to be able to control your actions anyway, or there's going to be some sort of inside influence. Yeah, and she's and keeper, doing that thing, and yeah. That her neighbor is making her. Yeah, the weird shakes. Yeah, they're keeping her physically weak. They're keeping her yeah. essentially docile in the fact that she doesn't have the strength to even move most of the time. She doesn't have the strength to fight back, uh, and she her wherewithal of her mentality is like, well, you're with the best doctor in the entire city, so how can you question his judgment? And the first time she meets him, he's like, I don't want you reading books. I don't want you listening to your friends. You listen to me. You know, and I don't want you taking vitamins. And then later on when she's like, well, I don't want to drink this shit anymore. Hey, I'll give you some fucking vitamins now. Uh, it, it's so much that just like you are going to only listen to us. We know what's best for you. You've never been through this before. And, and none of the people you know are as good as who we are. So we're the upper class. We're the smartest people in the fucking room. You've got to pay attention to what we're telling you. And everybody else can fuck right off. And so it just it keeps her so unbalanced in the things and so when she has the book when 
uh, Hutch has left her this book and she starts to realize what's going on, the guy is like, well, I don't want you reading that book. You're in the wrong frame of mind to be reading it. It's just going to upset you. And he puts it up on the shelf. And then the next day when she goes to look for it, he's thrown it away. He's completely tossed it. And he expects still at this point that he's going to be able to keep her from exploring it any further. And that's why they're always like, oh, you're going to meet a friend out in the city? Well, uh, Minnie's going to show up randomly later on. And that friend is never going to show up because we're going to put him to a coma. Just everything is like all of her lifelines are erased. Yep. Yeah. I'm trying to think of anything else in this. And and also, just Guy as himself is such a dick because as soon as she goes and cuts her hair, she gets a cut at Vidal Sassoon, and she's so proud of it, and he's just immediately like, that's the fucking worst haircut I've ever seen. You are stupid for doing that. I can't believe you would allow somebody to do that to you. Fuck, you spent yeah, yeah. my money on that shit? Like, holy fucking shit. That guy was a dick. Well, that just that helps really paint the picture that he's just doing everything for himself. He doesn't care yeah. about her. He doesn't care about her feelings. Um, and one thing I, I did cross my mind before uh, with the shakes, like when she's she wants to run and talk to the other doctor and she tells the neighbor like, hey, I got to go. And the lady was like, oh, that's fine. Just drink your shake later. There's like a glimmering hope where you're like, you know what? Maybe they aren't asshats. And then you just find out later that they're complete asshats. Complete asshats. <sighs> so just wanted so nice. Just wanted the neighbor lady to be nice. Fucking ass. Yeah, and and when at the scene at the end when she goes to Doctor Hill, I think is his name, the first yeah. doctor she had, mm -hmm. you really think that he's gonna help her? Mm -hmm. You really, really, really believe it? And and then it and I don't even think he was in on it. I think he just. Oh, he yeah. felt like he was crazy and she needed help. So he called her husband to protect her from herself. Mm -hmm. I think he, he saw it as, okay, she's got this prepartum depression because he respects, he said he met Dr. Abraham before and he, he probably just assumes, well, your patient is a little looped out. So as a professional and, and a colleague, I'm going to call you. But I don't know that I because he doesn't show up in the room at the end, right? I don't think he was part of that group. No, he he's not in the room at the end. I think that, and I don't know if you remember that conversation when Rosemary was telling telling him everything she was going through. I think that when she mentions Doctor Abraham, that's when he's like, "Wait, I think you just have a problem." First, I believed you, but now right. I'm mm -hmm. not sure because he's kind of my mentor, and I really respect this guy. Which I mean politically is so in tune with where we are right now in the fact that healthcare is not very respectful to women is not respectful to how they control their own bodies or or just their their thoughts and their needs about their pregnancies and stuff it's like oh you're just crazy it's it's not like we've gone much further than the days when we just assumed that they all had lunacy and we would masturbate women because of the cycles of the moon uh, because you're just crazy because you're a woman it, it that's that's sort of like we haven't really improved things and this is a shining example of that because it continues to be how it is today oh you think that your baby's got you've got witches next door that are trying to kill you and, and take your kid oh no you're just nuts bitch and we're just gonna lock you up and protect you from yourself and protect your baby from you and we're not worried about your mental health or anything we're just gonna give you back to your abusive husband and your abusive doctor that you just told me about are trying to kill you. Yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah, I don't and care I about your rights. You know, witches or no witches, sat satanist, satanistic people or not. I think if somebody has such like seems to be in such a state of trauma, it's worth just checking in that she because okay, you don't believe in supernatural. Maybe you believe in psychopaths and just dangerous mm -hmm. people. No, it's it's worth looking into it. I think. Right. And the only people who really had her back besides her friend Hutch, who investigated everything, were her girlfriends, who, again, as soon as they could, they cut her off from all of them. And it's like, don't listen to them. All right. I've got four women in the next room, some of whom have had kids and stuff like that. And you're telling me that they're all wrong. And I should listen to this guy who tells me that the pain's going to go away in two days. And I've had it for months. All right, thanks, guy. Uh, let's talk about your vasectomy that I'm about to give you uh, with a random pocket knife because it should be okay. 
you know, I think the pain will go away in a day or two. <laughs> I don't, why does having Satan's baby hurt more? Because I, I, he loves you that much. I, th- I think it hurt pretty much the, the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've never had a child, so I'm not sure. Because you're giving the... birth to a beast. They they don't show the child in this, which I was a little disappointed by, but I can yeah, understand because they described it. Um, they describe his eyes, and they say, well, look at his hands and look at his feet. So you got to assume that he's got cloven feet mm-hmm. and he's got clawed hands. So what it is is you're giving birth to a beast, which is not <laughs> a human thing. So your body's going to going to reject it. Your body is going to try to fight it like it's an infection. Fair enough. I just assumed it was kind of like the, the, the first point in the direction of something's not right here, which obviously it is. You know what I mean? Um, it, to, to, to counter your point of that you were upset you didn't see the, the child, had you seen the child and it looked like shit, you would have been pissed. And yeah, to, exact- probably take away from the timelessness of the movie. Yep, and I'm upset that you don't see it either, but had they showed it and it looked like shit, this movie would not hold up. And yeah, I think it's actually really, really powerful that it doesn't show the child because I see the child in my head. <laughs> I have nightmares still to this day. I think I've seen this movie for the first time. I don't know, I was a teenager. It's probably 16, 15, I don't know. And I... It, it really... Um, like because you don't see it, you can imagine it however way you like. And I think that's even more terrifying than... It's like the sound in Nosferatu. Monster. Yes. Yeah. So how long until you think this gets remade again? Oh, God. Like I said, I, I've already seen something just recently with uh, Michael Che and Gabby Hoffman that looked very similar in what it was doing. Uh, I didn't catch but the last 10 minutes of it, but it seemed like her whole building was people that were trying to take her baby away from her. There's There's been so many things that have referenced it. Will it get remade at some point? Did Maybe. you know that this was a TV miniseries in 2014? No. no, but that makes sense. Yeah, ABC starring Zoe Zeldana. Uh, I wow. A modern four-hour miniseries adaptation of the classic novel. Yeah, Beach just said the same thing. Um, but it's it's got to be really hard. I mean, it's one of those movies. It's like if they wanted to remake The Shining. <laughs> it's got so much personality. Yeah, I was it just gonna make a comment amazing. about wanting to watch the yeah. miniseries, and Beach just says it sucked with with five views. So you know it's bad. But I agree. Um, you cannot remake The Shining, which I'm sure they eventually will do, and it'll piss off everyone. Well, they did except- a miniseries of The Shining. A remake? An ABC miniseries of The Shining with Stephen Weber from Wings. That was supposed to be more like the novel, and by that I mean it was boring. But it it happens. ABC was on their kick of doing every Stephen King book or series. Which, I feel like I need to fix that statement. Like I think Stephen King's novels are good, but the the movies are good too. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not a reader... I, I really want to watch, or I want to, I want to listen to the Dark Tower before it comes out. We all know that's not going to happen. Um, yeah, I just can't get through fucking books. Uh, uh, the movie that I've been talking about is called Lyle, and it is a sinister ode to Rosemary's Baby with uh, the Gabby Hoffman movie. Um, neither of you watched the show Damien, did you? What show? Damien. Damien was like, off the Omen. Yeah, the kid from the Omen as a grown up. Oh no. How, I heard it was. I, I don't. I heard it was shit. Like I had it recorded, and um, it got canceled before the first season was over. So yeah, I heard it didn't do well. Good. Yeah. I'll never and and that. the didn't they do a remake of the Omen a couple years ago too? And it was also yes. not good. It was not good, but it wasn't terrible. It was better than the sequels, which isn't really hard to do. The Omen two was was. I remember it being good and and terrifying at the same time. But by the time you got to the Omen three, and then the Omen sister, uh, and the Omen in a dog down the street, those those were all awful. But certainly the Omen was really good, and one of those things that I think stood out as as one of the top scary films uh, came out in nineteen seventy six. There are things about that, that still kind of like stick in my head today. Mm-hmm. But when you see the remakes and they're just doing the same shit again, I don't know that that's necessary. So Beat has vouched for the show Damien 
saying that it's good and it was actually kind of scary. Oh, go beat. Yeah, right. I know I have to watch it. Thank God he's looking out for us. I know, right? Someone has to because I'm fucking lazy. Um, I, I am out of topics for this movie, so feel free to fight it out, you two. I feel there was something else I wanted to say, but I can't. Do you think Roman and Minnie were pissed off when they had to leave their house for or act like they were moving out for a couple of weeks and then just like, ah, shit. Yeah. So she she thinks we're witches. And so we have to go away and 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 promote the illusion like she's safe in her home and everything. And then she gets back to her house. And of course, everybody's just like hanging out in there. Uh, when she's like trying to lock herself in to to protect herself from her husband, you see him kind of sneak by in the hallway. It's like, do you think they were just pissed? Like, look, bitch, we know you 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 got some ideas in your head as to what's going on, and we're we're gonna humor you. But you know, fuck, man, I I had stuff on the DVR I wanted to watch in 1968. <laughs> I I I had I had this roast in the fridge that I was gonna make this week. I don't get to make my roast. That this. Groceries are cheap. Do you, but... do you also feel like they maybe just be like, well, it's for Satan, so we'll just deal with this. But you ever do something for your boss and you're like, yeah, I'll do it because I want to keep my employment and I want you to be happy and shut up and I got a vacation in two weeks that I want to go on and you approved All it when I probably shouldn't have approved it. Yeah, so you know, it's, it's sometimes your boss is an asshole, especially when he's Satan. <laughs> I feel like Satan as a boss would be double, double the asshole zero of the fun i mean he's no jehovah because that guy will not give me a fucking raise to save my life man i listened to five hours of a podcast about l ron hubbard and let me tell you that guy was a fucking nut job (laughs) yeah he was i don't know if you get into scientology at all rebecca i know some stuff but insane people that start cults are fascinating to me and I, i i did a lot of driving so i listened to it I mean, it's only important to get into it if you want to be successful in Hollywood. <sighs> That's true. Which That's this movie true. also teaches us. That's true. I don't want to sell my soul to me. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't want to. But I mean, if it's if it's one or the other. Yeah. You are a, an aspiring film superstar. I was going to say a filmmaker, but you're already making films, so you're doing it. But if you want to be a superstar, sell your soul to the devil. Please don't sell your soul to the devil. We do not endorse Satanism on this podcast. <laughs> not so whatsoever. Seeing, seeing that Tom Cruise was born in 1962 and this movie came out in 1968, do we think that this movie was about the birth of Tom Cruise? Was Tom Cruise born with cloven feet? Uh, he is short, so they probably had to cut him off to give him actual, like they molded them into actual feet. Oh, later that's on. why he's so short. They had to cut oh off like, six got six, like from the knee, knee, knee to the hoof. I have a serious question. That, well, it's not serious, but like... Good, we're perfect for that. The, the, the closet. Uh, you know the, the closet for which you go at the end to go to the other apartment and mm-hmm. there was um, the piece of furniture was in front of it at the beginning? Yeah. Why was the piece of furniture in front of a closet? I the wonder end? that too, because they don't explain it, but it does seem like that the lady who lived there before probably knew a little bit about them probably because she could hear them through the walls too and decided she didn't trust them and put that there to keep them out, to keep them from being able to invade her home. But she was older and she didn't have anybody to really protect her and she was a shut-in as well. Um, so I, I wish that they would have explained that as too. And she does kind of decide she can get through the closet rather easily. Um, yeah. She just kind of determines, oh, well, well Here's this closet. I wonder if I can just wander through that to wind up in the place next door. Um, they don't really give us enough explanation on either of those things, but I think you're right. I think there was something else there that we just didn't catch. If I may cut in. Beat wanted yeah. me to point out when Pauly Shore was born. 1968. You oh, leave, shit. You leave the fucking weasel out of this. But again, we're expecting some sort of success and Polly Shore does not mean... He was success. really popular in the 90s. Yeah, you know, a lot of things were popular in the 90s. That that other fucking idiot that was on MTV that they got off the streets and they decided to Jesse. make a VJ for a little while. Yeah, yep. you know, our standards what were is, pretty fucking low in the 90s, okay? What is, what is Jesse? 
MTV VJ. What do you think he's up to these days? Uh, I assume he's back on the street at where we meet. He's still alive. He's got that going for him. He... <laughs> I don't know if that's going for him. <laughs> well, he looks like a fucking strung out uh, Steven Tyler who so, same? looks like a strung out Steven Tyler. So he's he's singing for the Black Crows? Probably. It, it literally doesn't say what he's up to these days. Wikipedia, get your shit together. Uh, Jesse Camp. He went to high school. Doesn't have internet where he is. Wow. All right. All right. Sorry. I, I, <laughs> I warned you we get off topic here, and this is the shit that happens. Oh, here we go. What the fuck happened to Jesse Camp? Uh, B points out that well, Cosby, Cosby was also really big in the 90s. Bill Cosby was big in the 80s, though, too, and the 70s, That's and the true. 60s before that. Bill Cosby had a lot of decades up until this one. <laughs> it's true. And if he had access to the water supply, he'd probably make a comeback in the 2020s. He may, he still may. He may beat the charges. He's not, but he no. might. He, no. Uh, it appears that Jesse Camp is doing absolutely nothing, but he looks like he's been doing a lot of heroin. I don't even know who that is. Good. <sighs> Congratulate no, yeah, yourself. Totally, that's that's better for you, but you win this round. Yeah. Let's stop talking about Jesse Camp before we get into some dark internet shit. This is the kind of talk we gotta save for next week when we're gonna have our screech come back. Did I tell you he was on your pretty face is going to hell? Yes. Yes. And I, yeah. I believe that the guy from Your Pretty Face is going to hell liked your tweet about it. Uh the character did. I don't know if the real guy did. I'm fucking home. Tell you the difference between them. Henry Zabrowski, if you're listening to this, get at me. He plays Gary Bunda, and your pretty face is going to hell. If you weren't aware, hmm. which is head screech on it. All right, <sighs> should we rate this? I think we should rate it. Rebecca, do you want to rate this? Uh, rate the movie. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to. I just figured I'd ask instead of forcing you into it. It's, it's something we do on the show, so. Okay. Uh, Sorry, we didn't prepare you for it. So, uh, rating out of five? well, we're gonna. <laughs> it was a yes or no question. Then I would have explained oh, it. Okay. Yes. Just, I think. Yes. All right. All right. <laughs> um, because I'm 12 years old, I love dick jokes. We're okay. gonna be going to the. We're going to the Fap Cave. Next week. All right. Um, we're gonna do it on a, th a three tier scale of masturbatory fun. Uh, first, we're gonna start out on uh the feature. The story that was the story of the movie. We do it on a zero to five scale. Um, this can do the story, the acting, the thing on a whole. And as our guest, Rebecca, you get to go first. So the thing as a whole, yep. uh, I give Between it. Between the acting and the storyline itself, we'll we'll also talk about uh, mm -hmm. and the other score is we'll talk about. Would you rewatch it? Does it earn a place on your shelf? And then finally, we'll talk about if the effects or the 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 film overall was scary. Um, how it stood up in that regard. So uh, going from just yeah. the, the acting and the story, what do you think? Uh, I will give it a five, not so much because of the story. I think the story would be more of a three, but I think that the acting is so good, so believable, and they create such full characters that it still deserves a five. Yeah. Corey, how about you? I I liked it a lot more than I thought I was going to, and and I agree that the acting really elevated it. I think the story was actually better than what I expected too. Knowing as much of it as I did, I was impressed by the scenes where she kind of went into fantasy, and it reminded me a little bit of what I've seen in some Stephen King things, like Pet Cemetery. Is there's the whole story about Pet Cemetery, but then there's the scenes where it talks about like other characters, where he's talking to this dead guy, and and all this other stuff is kind of happening that adds an extra layer to it and this did that in its own way as well uh, i liked how when her friends came over it seemed realistic to what part they should play in that i think it was really good uh i'm gonna go 4.5 oh it's right there in the middle um i love this movie uh, it's it's a great movie I, it, there was certain parts in which i didn't feel like the acting was all that great um so i gave it a four but I'm like, I'm like a big toddler, so great acting gets lost on me really quickly. So, 
please don't be offended if you thought the acting was top notch in this movie. I just I'm offended. I have a hard time putting my pants on the right way in the morning. And it's not because I'm a big fan of 90s crisscross. Right. Thanks, guys. Yeah, jump, uh, make jump, jump. <laughs> Patty Wack will make you jump, jump. Uh, the next category we have is the uh, attention. Uh, this is more towards where Corey mentioned the rewatchability of the movie. Would you purchase this? Would you recommend this to you, all of your friends? Yeah, I absolutely would. This is one of my favorite movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very picky, especially with horror. I find that a lot of horror movies are sometimes kind of forgettable, even though they have a strong impact like on the moment. Like, for example, um, I watch, when I watch Rosemary's Baby, I think about it for days and sometimes weeks. It kind of haunt me. Like right now, I'm kind of scared in my quiet apartment because of Rosemary's Baby. So yes, definitely. It's, I own it. It's on my shelf. Everybody should watch it. It's really good uh it's a zero to five scale sorry five okay i figured i just wanted to make sure i don't want to do any talking for you sorry max you know numbers <laughs> <laughs> Corey, how about you um i don't know how much i'll need to rewatch it myself but i'm glad that i finally did and it's certainly something that i think everybody should see uh even if you're like me and you just you thought you knew better uh like some dumb fool of yourself piece of shit uh Whoa. that's me and so uh i'm gonna give it a four okay um i don't know why i said okay i'm all pumped about it um i give it a five i do own this movie and i have owned this movie for a very long time uh i watched it in high school and just i've always loved it so part of me wants a remake but none of me wants that remake uh, well i i never i always want to see like an updated version of something but i don't want to ruin it so it's just better left the way it is you know it's going to start with paltrow well no probably not now but yeah. certainly 10 years ago it would have it, or julia styles it, who was the mom in the omen remake it, it seems it'll be emma watson <clears throat> oh yeah yeah you know i'm right all right the last uh, category we have is our uh, panic uh how are the effects to you anything scare you surprise you i already know the answer to this based on what you just said before but uh rebecca why don't you go ahead and start it off well, um, yeah, again, I'll give it a five. Um, <laughs> um, it's not, it's definitely not like a jump, you know, kind of movie. It doesn't, it doesn't scare you that way. It's more like a crawling, creepy kind of way that haunts you, which is very powerful. I think. So yeah, five. Yeah, I think, Corey? Yeah, the, what you're afraid of is more, is what she believes is real actually happening or not. Uh, the the fact that the whole cultist aspect is really what it is, is how helpless are we when we've been separated from the people who would actually protect us uh, or support us um, when everybody else in your world is now suddenly people who are not on your side. When I got together with my wife back when we were first dating, I was insisted that she have her own friends and I have my own friends, not because I didn't like the people she hung out with and vice versa, but because I wanted her to have a life outside of our relationship uh, because it makes us both stronger people individually, which makes us stronger as a couple. And, and we managed to maintain that, but it's not as important now as it was then, but I still kind of believe that that's sort of the thing is that you take away everything that was your own and, and you are left with only what you're allowed to have. And that, that puts you in a bad situation. Uh, in that regard, it's scary to me. Uh, I'm going to give it a four. For a second there, I thought you were going to start giving out free uh, relationship advice. I do. Don't date Matt. <laughs> Don't date Matt. That was a good advice. Oh. <laughs> oh. I gave it a four. It's a good movie. It's pretty scary. Not my, not my feelings are hurt. Corey, read the, read the outro. Uh, you can contact us, but not Matt. By leaving us a voicemail at 805-328-3966, you can email us at pot at gncast.com, uh, or you can leave a message on the website. Uh, please follow the show on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We're at Podcast of Terror and all those places. Also subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and leave us a review on any of those podcatchers, whichever one you use, or all of them if you want to take the time. We appreciate the reviews. It helps us get a bigger audience, uh, which we like. Because uh, then we can keep doing this and infect more people with our bullshit. 
All subscription options and links can be found at gncast.com slash subscribe. And you can join our Facebook group. Uh, our page is Podcast of Terror on Facebook, or our network's page is the Galactic Network. And go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, Rebecca, you push push everything right now. All right. So you can find me on all social media and my production company name, which is Horromance. So that's a mashup of the word horror and romance. And that's on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And it's also the name of my website, so horromance.com. Would you prefer, because we have your personal Twitter, I think, in our chat notes uh, or our, mm -hmm. our show notes, but we can switch it to the production company one if you want before we publish this. Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'll do that. Well, like Corey said, we'll have all of the, the links in the show notes and everything. So uh, I urge you to uh, to follow everything that uh, Rebecca's doing. I'm excited for it. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming. Corey, uh, where can people not find you? Because you're a dick. I am a dick. Um, you know what? I'm not even going to tell you to find me this week. This week, I'm going to say, hey, if you're on Instagram, and you want to see some amazing lowbrow art, uh, check out my wife's Instagram. It's mm -hmm. hag underscore attack. Uh, she's doing a lot of great stuff. She's got a zine coming out that's going to feature her pretty soon. And she's also got another zine that she's organizing. Uh, she's kind of in charge of it that she's organizing with a bunch of other female artists, all doing lowbrow art, all about dicks. Uh, so I highly recommend it if you are our audience and you love the peepees. Uh, this is going to be a really amazing zine. Uh, and not for the faint of heart and uh check it out hag underscore attack on instagram or you can go to arthag.com do that too she has some really awesome drawings uh, i'm trying to give her my money to draw draw on the lifeguard shirt so hopefully soon um you can find me on twitter and instagram and uh about 35 seconds ago i changed my own tap name all to matt the lifeguard so i don't have to say two sentences worth of shit so follow me on social media see how much drinking i do and um Send me beer recommendations. I do really, really, really like beer. That is going to do it for another episode of the Podcast of Terror. Thank you guys very much for listening. Awesome. Bye, YouTube. I'm going to turn Bye, you YouTube. off now. Thanks for hanging out. Growly, Beat, Ashley, thanks for hanging out.